We're glad you're here. I hope that you enjoyed your lunch. Please welcome Miss Debbie Powell. Thank you. <laughs> I'm clapping for you guys. <laughs> you have been awesome. The spirit here is so high and positive and energetic. And I thank you for that because with that positiveness comes good things. So um, thank you so much for um, your, your spirit and your attitude about the training technical assistance. I will start off again by asking you to you know, fill out your, um, your evaluations, use the app, or you can do it in hard copy if you choose to, but we want to hear from you. We want to know what you liked, what the challenges were, what you'd like to see more of, and what we can do better. So once again, please take a moment, and um, hopefully you do it through the app. Is um, we're, trying to, we're trying to move into the millennium, and so we're quite proud of that app. So please, oh, excuse me, William says the new millennium. Okay, so I'm still at the other millennium, so I'm trying to move in. So, okay, so I want to acknowledge that this is my most disfavored part of this conference because we get to acknowledge our young people. And as we heard from Dr. Baker and from probably many of your other workshops, it's so important that we let our young people know how proud we are of their accomplishments how much potential they possess in their bodies. This is an opportunity for us to do that. So a little background. The Family and Youth Services Bureau's RHY Mural Contest has been an annual tradition since 2012. This contest has benefited many RHY grantees with opportunities to engage youth in life skill activities, incorporate positive youth development, and create a bright space to showcase the creativity of young people. Art is a critical part of youth development. They've told us many times that this is how they express themselves. And so that's why we feel it's so important to include this piece um, throughout the year and at our conference. We've been told by not only Dr. Baker, but other um, neuroscience researchers that it can improve brain power, academic achievement, memory, creativity, social skills, language and reading skills, and critical thinking skills. In addition, it creates cultural and personal connections, instills discipline, and builds confidence. How can you go wrong with something like that? So, I'm hoping that um, you all will enjoy this particular presentation and we will get more mural applications next year. I think that we did increase from the year before since 2017, but we really know there are many, many youth out there that could really benefit from this positive youth development opportunity. So I am hoping that you will see and hear from the youth that won this mural contest and see how important it is in their development. So, today I have the honor of introducing youth and staff from Ocean's Harbor House Transitional Living Program in Toms River, New Jersey. They are the winner this year for 2018. And that applause was for you, Noah and Brandon. So just so you know, you're the stars for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> Each year, we encourage you, RHY grantees, to support young people in their programs to sketch a mural they'd like to create. To enter the contest, programs submit a rough sketch and a one or two page description detailing the meaning of the mural and the youth-driven creative process. Entries are judged on young people's role in crafting an agency's mural sketch and narrative. The meaningfulness and creativity of the design and the connection to the theme, realizing youth potential. Judges include a panel of FISB staff, RITAC Advisory Board members, and youth from National Safe Place Network's National Youth Advisory Board Collaboration Committee, affectionately known as YCC. The winning agency receives a gift card to cover the purchase of art supplies to turn their sketch into life. The key here is youth working as a team to express themselves through the visual arts. 
The resulting murals can and do represent many things. They could represent perhaps the people around them in their lives, whether those people around them be youth or the staff, their mentor, the family with whom they have reconnected, or the permanent connections they are developing as they move into adulthood. Possibly an opportunity to share their experience of homelessness, including their fears, which is really important for them to have a space to do that, their hopes, their successes, and their insights with others, not the least of who could be their peers. And lastly, but not least, maybe their murals express the healing and the growth from the trauma they have experienced as being a runaway and homeless youth. Whatever the reason, whatever the expression, we embrace and applaud that expression. All the murals entered into each year's contest, they're works of valuable art to the youth and to us, but they're also so much more. Each final mural is the outward face of an underlying process that helped the youth move their perception to paper and ultimately to the public eye. It is in the public eye where we hope these murals can make the thoughts and experience of runaway and homeless youth real to the communities. Because let's face it, sometimes communities don't really understand how to communicate with runaway and homeless youth. Thus, they don't know how to emphasize, empathize with them. They don't understand the trauma of living on the street or not knowing from night to night where you will lay your head. And just as importantly, it is a way for you to come together as a team and turn their thoughts and their feelings to a visual statement, a meaningful and colorful addition to the program that will spark more meaningful conversations among youth and staff for a long time to come. The Ocean Harbor House TLP, now it has in the, in the subject the, TLP, the supervised TLP. So I'm not sure what that means, so I have dropped the supervised piece of it, and I'm sure when you come up, you will explain to us just what that means. Um, so, so, uh, was a, so they have um, um, brought their young people here. The Ocean Harbor House TLP was established in 2001 to meet the needs of older youth ages 16 to 21, these youth were too old for traditional shelter services, yet they still required supervised housing and our everyday life skills in order to become self-sufficient, independent youth and adults. Youth who participate at Ocean Harbor House receive the following services. Educational and vocational counseling, job search, interview skills, resume writing, SAT and GED preparation, weekly support groups, anger management, drug and alcohol prevention, parent and sibling support, along with other groups pertaining to self-sufficiency. They also receive referral and case management services and individual and family counseling. As the program describes itself, for older youth who are homeless and need transitional housing, our TLP offers fully supervised housing in the Toms River area. The Shore Supportive Housing Opportunity through Rehabilitation and Encouragement, which is a mouthful, is a supportive transitional living facility that promotes a successful transition to adulthood for 12 youth at any given time. Participants range from age 16 to 21 are offered secure and stable living conditions for up to 18 months. While staying within Ocean House, these youth receive life skill counseling and training, including budget and financial management, menu planning, nutrition and food preparation, use and management of credit, consumer education, housing, personal hygiene, safety instructions, planning for leisure and social activities, and methods of obtaining vital documents such as social security cards, birth certificates, etc. 
So you will get an opportunity to hear much, much more about their program. But I have the pleasure of introducing to you Noah Baker, Brandon Gore, as our 2018 RHY Mural winners. So Brandon and Noah will join me on the stage with Heidi Hartman, one of the staff representatives. Hi, my name is Brandon Gore, and this is, this is my housemate, my friend, my brother, Noah Baker. We are both residents at Ocean's Harbor House Transitional Living Program. And let me tell you a little bit about the sketch. So um, around seven months ago, I had just came to Harbor House. It was my first group session with my, uh, with my, um, sorry, uh, my life skills counselor, Allison McLaren. And she told us this week, we're gonna do a sketch. Um, the theme is potential and so Everybody in the house, we all came downstairs, and she told us, all right, brainstorm. So we all brainstormed, and I, you know, I sketched everything down, and we came up with a lot of good ideas. And so there was a lot of details and, um, that came up because we all brainstormed so much. Um, there's you know, the, the world in the hand, um, which has you know, a lot of meaning to me, and there's potential written in the stars, and climbing the ladder of, of positivity. And you can't see it on, a, on the picture up there, but each rung of the ladder had a word there um, to mean something, you know, like, like motivation, determination, the things you needed to climb the mountain. And <laughs> as a student right now, it, you know, I relate to that a lot, climbing that mountain to get to the world, in the, you know, in the background. Um, I'd like to speak a bit about my first night at, uh, at Har Ocean's Harbor House and what they've done for me. Um, my first night at the, at the shelter, I, uh, it was, I cried, honestly. It was, it was amazing. I've, and I know what you're thinking, wow, glowing review, but no, it was good. Um, <laughs> I had never felt so safe and so secure in such a long time, and it was amazing. I'm truly thankful for, for that and for everything. So, yeah, there's so many things I wouldn't have been able to do without the help of the amazing people I work with every day and I live with, um, you know, working on getting my car and my license, uh, going to school, all of that, having them there to help me with that is, is everything and I couldn't do it without the people. So I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Ocean's Harbor House, I'd like to thank all the people who were there to support me throughout this. Um, in terms of the mural, I'd like to thank uh, Jen Santa Maria, I couldn't have done it without her. She, she's contributed so much to this uh, mural and helped us out so much. Um, I'd like to thank Fisby. I'd like to thank Ride Tech, the National Safe Place, and I'd like to thank everyone here for being here. And just thank you all so much. <laughs> As you said, I've been to the shelter program twice. It has been really helpful towards me. And I know a lot of kids that go in and out. And I've been in the STLP program for 17 months now. And when I first got there, I was going through a lot. I had a hard time in school. And as of lately, I've been doing a lot better. With Brandon helping me out, he's a good friend of mine. And all the staff there are always willing to help you out pointing in the right direction with whatever it is that if you need help with just simple life skills there's someone there for you or as simple as just budgeting a check or figuring out what you should do when your time is coming to an end um, and that's all I really have to say I just want to say that it's a great program and it's, it helped me out a lot
My name is Heidi Hartman. I'm the Director of Youth Services for Ocean's Harbor House. Um, and what I think my friends here have really expressed is how important the continuum of care is. Both of these um, young men were in our shelter program and transitioned into our supervised, which just means we have staff 24-7 available to help them, um, our supervised transitional living program. Um, it gives them a sense of community and family, and this project has been just so exciting for the whole organization and really the community. They've rallied behind our kids. Um, we're having an art show. This will be on display at our art show. Um, and because of this project and because of the interest that they have in this project and the um, goals and excitement they have around art, we've started an art therapy program within our organization too. So this will continue. Uh, I just wanted to thank FISB also for this exciting opportunity. And to our young friends here who are representing all the kids in the house who worked on this, we are so proud of you, not just today, but every single day. So I think it's picture taking time, and it's also the opportunity for FISB to present you with your plaque. Come back, Brandon and Noah. <laughs> We want to present you with this plaque. It says, presented to Ocean Harbor House Inc. 2018 Fisbee Mural Contest winner and your gift card. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. And so we want to take pictures. We also like um, Keith to come up. Keith is the program manager. See why it's my favorite time. I mean, give me a tissue. So, <laughs> this is why I respect you so much with the work that you do. You support young people to have confidence in themselves, and you tell them every day that they are worth so much to you and to us. And so that's why I know that the work that we do at the federal level doesn't compare with what you do in direct services because you have a direct relationship of building you know, young adults, positive, you know, confident young adults. So never underestimate what you are in the life of a young person. So I still wanna give you guys another hand for the work that you do every day. So I have an, an announcement. I am so excited about this announcement. Um, I talked to you earlier about wanting you all to encourage your young people to enter the contest. And so we thought about it and we wanted to open up other opportunities to do that because some kids don't enjoy maybe doing art. But we want to announce that beginning in 2019, the FISBY RHY mural contest will begin the new FISBY RHY artistic expression contest. This content, mm -hmm. this because you know I'm not a person that you know draws, but I can do some spoken word. So you know I, I we had to add that. So the contest will now include um, steel drawings, paintings, writings, spoken word, vocal, instrumental work, dance, and more. I can also dance. So, you know, that was part of me too. So, I, you know, we have to be inclusive here, you know? So, 
you all heard that? I want you to know, I know there's somebody in everybody's program that can do one of these expressions. So I want a record number of young people, and I would even like, you know, maybe next year invite the first, second, and third place persons to come to the conference. Is that some incentive? <laughs> Woohoo! Okay. So um, speaking about positive youth development, I get the opportunity and the pleasure to introduce um, Justin Haywood. Justin's gonna be somewhat of our Mr. of Ceremonies. Um, and so he's going to be here to introduce our speakers. And what I, I have just met Justin, but I keep an ear out because I'm very nosy so I listen. You know, when people talk around me, don't think I'm listening. And I heard that just he's a very articulate young man. He may have some nerves, but he sat down at this table and just start asking our presenters questions. Hey, I didn't do that. I didn't even speak to Darren Hicks. So, you know, I mean, wow, he had the confidence to walk right in, say, man, what you do, why you do what you do. Justin, you got this, okay? So let me give you a little bit about Justin. Justin Haywood is a 23-year-old young adult advocate whose friends call him Prince. His positive and negative experiences in child protective services, running away and being homeless have made him into the man he is today. Currently, he is an active leader in the Houston area and a member of three formal youth advocacy boards, including T Noise, which is the Young Adult Leadership Council, National Youth Forum on Homelessness at the Harris County Youth Collective. Wait a minute, see Justin, I messed up too. I only did two, didn't I? I'm sorry. Okay, wait a minute. T Noise, National Youth Forum on Homelessness, and the Harris County Youth Collective. He has been blessed to overcome the statistics of being an African American male in and out of the various systems as a, young, as a youth and champions for change on all levels for the next generation. Please join me in welcoming Justin Haywood. Um, how you guys doing? I'm Justin, of course, as he just said. Um, I just wanted to start this off by, you know, asking you guys to ask yourself a question. Um, you know, why, why, are you, why are you all here? You know, um, why is it important for your organizations to collaborate with others, you know, to challenge or to, you know, take down this one goal that we all have, which is ending homelessness? Um, I'm here to, you know, to introduce the month, which is the National Runaway Prevention Month. It's an awareness prevention uh, campaign that happens every November that, uh, that hosts multiple events, activities throughout the month. Um, it is coordinated by the National Runaway Safe Line, Safe Line, the federally designated communication system for runaway and homeless youth with the support and family of you, with the support of Family and Youth Services uh, Bureau. Um, the, theme, the theme for this year is to shine a light. Uh, I really like the theme personally um, because it doesn't, doesn't just shine a light on the issues that, that, that homelessness that homeless youth face every day, but it also shines a light on the resources, the resources available um, to the homeless youth that are actually experiencing it right now. Uh, so for right now, guys, I want you to get you, not your real pen and paper, but you know, for the old millennium, millennium, for the old millennium. <laughs> but you can also <laughs> get your phone, get your phone out and get your calendar um, for these days. Uh, every day, every day in November, you know, you know, on Facebook, you guys can change your uh, profile theme. Um, so I really want to encourage that everybody, you know, change changes their profile theme. Um, and if you don't know how to do it, all you have to do is just search NRPM, which is of course the National Runaway Prevention Month and um, that option should be available to you guys. Um, November 6th is the Wear Green Day. Um, I'm, I'm big on Instagram, so of course I will be in my green and I will be posting on Instagram with the hashtag N NRPM2018, make sure you put 2018. Um, November 13th is the shine, light, light the night, I was gonna say shine light on the night, light the night, um, where agencies and communities, you know, they all have a candlelight to shine a light on these issues with, for homeless youth that are going, that are currently homeless. I don't I keep saying homeless youth, that are currently homeless. Um, November 20th is a Teachable Tuesday where uh, the Safe Line will post current statistics for you to share with friends and to 
bring awareness to you know real life, real life data, you know um, that that that's going on right now as we speak. Um, on November 29th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, so that's 2 p.m. our time. Uh, you can guys get on get on Twitter. I have a Twitter also, so you guys get on Twitter and uh, join the live chat. Um, all you have to do is just hashtag again. The hashtag is in. Uh, P N N R P M 2018. Um, I really want to encourage you guys to, to join that chat because you know, there's a lot of us young people have social media, and that's where we you know connect with the world uh, on a holistic level. So it'd be great for you guys you know to join in on that on that live chat. Um, I just want to you know articulate the, imp uh, the importance of the hotline. Um, when I was about 10 years old, that's when I started getting kicked out of my house and uh, quote unquote running away. And um, if I knew about this hotline, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to sleep at my playground in elementary school. I was sleeping in my playgrounds, you know, sleeping in bushes and stuff of that nature. So I really wanna, you know, bring awareness to this, to this hotline because, you know, and participating in this month because, you know, it could save a life. It could save a life. You wearing green on that, on that, on that day, somebody might go and see, oh, they're a part of this uh, campaign. Let me reach out to them. I'm going through something. I'm going through a crisis. Let me reach out to these people. You know, you changing your Facebook, uh, your Facebook frame. You know, they could go on Facebook. Let me look. Let me reach out to this person. I'm going through something. They might know something that you know other people that I deal with don't know. You know, you can save a life. Um, I know personally, if I if I would have seen somebody with a green shirt on Instagram, I would I would have reached out. You know, at 10 years old, I would have reached out. So. Um, I really want to, you know, push for that, you guys to participate. Um, last, but I also want to say, why waste time being here if you aren't going to participate and collaborate with others to reach on a common goal, which is, of course, to end homelessness. So we're all here. Why not participate? You see what I'm saying? Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers. The first one would be uh, Mr. Dennis Van Campen. Dennis Van Campen is a, vision, a visionary leader and consultant with, uh, who works with organizations and individuals and systems to bring measurable change. He has served the community as an executive director of several nonprofits as a pastor, a faculty member of a university, and as a reserve sheriff de deputy. Excuse me. Currently, he is the president and CEO of Mel Charter Ministries, a $10 million human service organization that helps walk, walk with and ex with experience Walk with those experiencing homelessness towards independence and security. Um, after years in leadership, Van Campen knows the power of bringing people and organizations together to focus on things that unite and make difference in our world. Van Campen also believes that we can change the world one life at a time through serving and putting the needs of those we serve above an individual, above any individual organization or system, which is big time. Uh, he believes the <laughs> he believes the highest calling is to serve others with dignity, humility, and passion. Um, ben Campen has also spoke and consulted around the country, and consulted around the country, and has been featured in interviews about leadership and serving others. He is an expiring author and blogs in and blogs on his website at www.dennisvancampen.com about life, faith, and doubt and leadership as well. Joining Dennis for our presentation today is Dr. Darren Hicks. Um, Dr. Darren Hicks is a professor in the Department of Communication Studies at the, the University of Denver. Um, Dr. Hicks' research, teachings, and technical assistant focuses on the communica communicative uh, dimension of community collaboration. He has worked closely with the Colorado Trust in Investing Kids, where he oversaw a 15-year research program that measured the influence of collaborations on program and outcomes in the Nurse Family Partnership, as well as, as, well as the Incredible Years program. He has also worked closely with the Administration of Children and Families uh, and, the, and the Colorado Department of Education on methods of for, of, on methods for evaluating collaboration and effects on uh, program successes. He has developed several instruments on, for measuring the quality of collaboration processes, which has also been widely used around the United States and also Canada. 
Um, Dr. Darren also teaches in the Network Leadership Training Academy and gives, in, and gives invited talks uh, across the country on collaboration for public, for public uh, agencies and at research universities. Lord have mercy, I apologize, y'all. <laughs> His current, his current research projects on collaboration includes uh, integrating collaboration measures with network analyst, analyst tools, creating agent-based models of collaboration to test the effectiveness of different stakeholders' inclusion strategies and developing a theor theor theoretical, theoretical, a theoretical model explaining the role of emotions in collaborations. In addition to his work on collaboration, Dr. Darren has also um, created a, a research program on political argumentation and debate. So he's professional. He's a professional at debating you and, and starting arguments, quote unquote. <laughs> um, his work has also been published in many journals. Dr. Hicks has a PhD and MA in speech communication with, uh, from Southern Illinois University. He received his BA in second in second education from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Thank you. <laughs> Can we give Justin a hand as... <laughs> Justin, you did a great job. I feel you. <laughs> Hello everyone, that was really weak. It's not breakfast, it's lunch. Hello everyone. You can't have the food coma yet. All right, Justin, thank you, you did a great job. I think my mother wrote that though, because who else would say that kind of stuff about you? Right, it had to be my mother. Um, hey, Brandon and Noah, everybody should have one person in their life who gives them a standing ovation, and you have 800. We can't wait to see what you do with your life. Can we give them another hand? All right, so uh, I get to talk to you today about collaboration and about how we can do more together. See, I truly believe, you know, Justin, Debbie was not kidding when she said that Justin was asking us these really tough questions. And he asked us the question, why do you do what you do? And the only answer that I could come up with, because it's the right one, is I honestly believe that we can change the world. But I honestly believe that we may not be doing it quickly enough, or we may not even be able to accomplish it if we don't work together. Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see. And we all love that quote. But what Gandhi was saying is, change to be the change that you wanna see. We have to change, we have to do more. We have to think about what it is that we're doing that's helpful, what it is that we're doing that may not be helpful, and how can we work alongside others that may have different ideas than us, but have the same goal. So that's what I wanna talk about today. As I was flying out here a couple of days ago, um, I'm on the airplane and I'm thinking, I have a lot of work that I could do. That doesn't sound like a good idea. I'm gonna look at what I can rent on the Delta movie screen. So I look at the Delta movie screen and I run across a documentary, I think HBO may have put it on, and it's about Robin Williams. And I have always been an amazing, a huge Robin Williams fan. Genius, just genius. I thought, wow, that's really interesting because ever since he died, I've been exploring, you know, what was his life like and what led to some of these things in his life. So I'm, I'm watching this documentary on the airplane and I'm struck. I'm struck by what his life was like as a child. As a child, he grew up alone and isolated. He had two brothers, but they didn't grow up in the same house. He had parents but dad was always traveling and mom was doing her other thing. And, and it showed these pictures and these film clips about his childhood life where he, would, he, would, he was really developing the comedy that he would later use. He was living in this fantasy world. He was so isolated and so alone that he had to create 
a whole other world for himself to operate in. And that actually became the basis of his comedy. But he never learned how to not be alone and not be isolated. There were interviews with his family, his brothers, one of his ex-wives, his closest friends, Billy Crystal, Steve Martin, who knew him very well. And one of the things that they, the common theme was he knew how to live life on the stage, but he didn't know how to live life off the stage. That's what he struggled with. This was one of the things that he said a few months before he died. All it takes is a beautiful fake smile to hide an injured soul and they will never notice how broken you really are. And while Robin Williams never experienced homelessness, Robin Williams knew something that so many youth and families know from homelessness. He knew isolation. He knew loneliness. He knew what it felt like to never really fit in. He knew what it felt like to have to perform and be something for someone and yet never feel like you were enough. And that really struck me as I was thinking about this talk. How many times do we not notice how broken we and the people that we work with really are? So I want to tell you about four stories uh, from our organization. Snow was sexually trafficked as a child. She was born and grew up in Michigan. And as a teenager, she was taken to Florida, sexually trafficked. And then from Florida to California, she was sexually trafficked again. And in California, when whoever it was that was controlling her life was done, done with her, they dumped her at a shelter. And somehow, I don't even know exactly how, but somehow Snow got in touch with the staff at Mel Trotter in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She wanted to come home. So we were able to work with her to get on a bus and to come back home to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And when she came back home, 18, 19, year, 19 years old, she was so broken. She was so broken. Alex is 18. Alex is hearing impaired. He was adopted from Russia when he was a small baby. His parents that adopted him were not great parents. And as soon as he turned 18, they moved to a different state and left him out in the cold in Michigan with nothing. Hearing impaired, 18-year-old, adopted from Russia, parents just say, I'm done with you, and move to a different state and leave him alone. Natalie. Natalie is a transgender individual. Natalie grew up in Indiana. Natalie, as she was trying to, to find her identity, knew that her family, her conservative Christian family, would never accept who she is. So Natalie didn't know what to do, and Natalie told me that she thought about, should I just kill myself? Should I just kill myself? But instead of that, she just started living on the streets and somehow found her way up north to Grand Rapids. And she was told about this, this organization, Mel Trotter, that had a transgender shelter. And she said, well, maybe they will accept me. And at 18, she walked into the shelter. Shantae was a foster child. She was ironically taken from a very difficult home situation and put in the foster care system only to be placed with foster parents that were worse than her biological parents. Only to be abused in all ways imaginable by her foster parents. And when she turned 18, her foster parents said, we're done, you're out of here. We have nothing left for you. So on the streets with no resources, with no anything, she finds herself. But I'm not sharing with you any stories that you don't know. You could, you could stand up, every one of you could stand up and tell your Snow story, your Alex story, your Natalie, your Shantae. We know, as, as William was saying yesterday, one in 30 youth to age 17 will become home, will, will experience homelessness. One in 10 18 to 24 year olds will experience homelessness. One in 10, that's as if we took about these first two rows of tables right here 
and in a room this size, that's how many youth are going to end up homeless. Does this get you up in the morning? One in seven youth, teenagers, will run away. And we know, we know that 87% of youth that experience homelessness more than once, K through 12, will not finish high school. And in, that, in this culture, if you don't finish high school, what kind of life are you likely to have? Our experience is that if a youth doesn't get help and doesn't finish high school, we will probably see them again in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s at our, at our shelter or laying on our streets. 40% aged out of foster care. In our community, it's about 43% that identified to their parents or loved ones as LBGTQ and were disowned, put on the streets. Do these things get you up in the morning? They do me. You know, Justin, why do you do what you do? I do what I do because of this. There is so much to do. Our challenges are so huge. We're fond of saying in our community, this problem is way too big for any one solution or one organization to solve. In my community, up to 200 youth are homeless and unaccompanied on the streets every single night. We're the largest organization in town and I can't do that alone. Our organization cannot impact that alone. But I firmly believe the challenge is not so big that if we would all come together, that we can't solve this thing. All come together as co-laborers, bringing what it is that we have to the table, bringing our expertise, bringing the things that you do better than anyone to the table and having it be a collective table where everyone is equal and everyone is focused on the same goal, that goal that Justin talked about with ending homelessness. But I don't know, if you're like me, you love collaboration when it's with people that either want to follow you or people that think like you do or believe like you do. Collaboration is easy then, but it's not effective. You know, we belong to a network of, um, they're called gospel rescue missions around the country. I'm sure many of your cities have them. And one of the challenges of belonging to a network like that is that, not always, but on some things, everybody is thinking the same. And we're not getting the results that we could get. We have huge challenges. An important question that we started asking in our organization that I ask of organizations that I speak with or consult with is, tell me what would happen if your organization did not exist tomorrow? What would happen? And I'm starting to believe that if the question, if the answer is, if we didn't exist tomorrow, there would be no answer for a hundred people or ten people or a thousand people on the street. There's a problem if that's the answer. Because if that's the answer, that means that you are operating in a silo and probably other organizations in your community are operating in a silo. Not that you don't do great things, not that you're not necessary, but are you working well together? Are you coming together for a common solution and a common goal? Or are we in silos? Are we in silos? My town is full of silos. Let me share with you what some of them are. There is the faith-based silo, all the organizations that are Christian. They're, for the, many of them are in a silo and they're happy in their silo. And then there's a silo for the non-faith-based organizations, and they also are happy and don't want anything to do with the faith-based silos. And then there's the government-funded silo, and there's the non-government-funded silo, and then there's the Housing First silo, and then there's the no programs and life change before Housing First silo, and there's all these silos. And if we're honest, we are all pretty prideful about our silos. And we can all articulate why we are right and every other silo is wrong. And what happens is the very people that we're called to serve suffer. They suffer from the impact that could happen that's not happening. 
There has to be another way. So what are those things that divide us? We've talked a little bit. Faith or non-faith. This one drives me nuts. So I'm going to try and be an equal opportunity offender, if that's okay. Thank you. Three people laughed. Three people are still awake. Everybody else is in the food coma. Justin told you that I'm a pastor, so I can say this. Faith-based organizations need to wake up. We, faith-based organizations, for the most part, there are exceptions. But there are many faith-based organizations that think that somebody has to attain some level before they're worthy of being helped. Or somebody has to agree to go to faith-based activities before you can give them a safe place to sleep or a meal. Now, I don't know what your faith persuasion is, but for those of you that are of the Christian persuasion, I would challenge you to find anything in the scriptures of when Jesus was on earth of how he manipulated people before he helped them. It's ironic that Christians, and I am one, actually are operating outside of how Jesus operated. It makes for great religion, it makes for terrible results. Faith-based organizations we have to say we love everyone, period. We are told, I don't know if it's true, uh, we're told at Mel Trotter, we know we're the first transgender shelter in the state of Michigan. We're told that we're the first faith-based transgender shelter in the entire country. Not sure if that's true or not. We've lost several of our conservative supporters, but other conservative supporters have learned what we're doing and they said, you're not going far enough, keep going. But here's what we say. Serving everyone with dignity and compassion and with no manipulation and no requirements is not compromising our faith, it's living it out. So people of faith, thank you. All right, so I'm going to be equal opportunity. Here's what I know about social workers. Here's what my experience has been. Social workers, you are the most tolerant people in the world. Nobody is more tolerant than a social worker. Except you're not tolerant for Christians. <laughs> we accept everybody. Except Christians. You cannot say that you're tolerant and accept everybody when you don't. Do you see the silo? Do you see the problem? How is this helping anyone? Could it be, could it be, that what unites us is actually greater than what divides us, in the words of JFK? Could it be that we could find collaboration partners that we never thought of before and never would have considered before because they don't do this or they do do this, but they're united around, you are united around ending homelessness one life at a time. Ending youth and family homelessness. Is it possible that what unites us is greater than what divides us? Or, you know, JFK, Maya, oh man, I don't know which one to pick. Maya, we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. If you are from a non-faith-based organization and you are an atheist and I am a Christian, I want to tell you we are more alike than we are unalike. And if you want to end youth and family homelessness, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's not get caught up on some of these differences and maybe how we do things or how we approach things. What unites us is greater than what divides us. And this is frankly what should unite us. This should turn our stomachs. This first picture should cause each of us to have sleepless nights. What should unite us is to move from the picture on 
your left to the picture on the right to get people into safe, stable housing. Here's what I know. Teachers are telling us that we're working with in, in the rural schools. They're saying, Dennis, we know within the first week of school who the homeless kids are. And here's how we know. The homeless kids come to school to do two things, to sleep and to eat. Because wherever they were last night, they didn't get enough food and they didn't get enough sleep. So they're here to sleep and eat. And therefore, they're not learning how to read. They're not learning math. They're not learning so many things. And we, by the time they're, this is what the teachers are telling us, by the time third grade has rolled around, if intervention hasn't happened, they are so far behind that the likelihood of them catching up is almost impossible. It's almost impossible. But yet we have numbers from organizations, even federal organizations, that tell us that homelessness is going down. I'm curious. Anybody in here experiencing homelessness going up? Yeah, yeah, huh. Wonder how those statistics could be wrong. But that's another topic, William. We'll talk about that some other time. Homelessness is going up, and it's going up in youth and families in the LBGT community faster than any other communities. And as I walk around Austin, I'm struck by how many people experiencing homelessness that I'm seeing. And my heart breaks for the elderly men that are laying on the sidewalk. But my heart breaks even more for the youth that could become the elderly men if we don't act. We can't let this happen. We can't let this happen. Apparently we like this slide. TJ, TC, what are you doing? Did it froze? Did it froze? That's not right. <laughs> I'm from Michigan. We talk like this a lot, and we don't have proper grammar. There we go. So what's standing in our way? <laughs> I know why you're laughing. Um, we build walls. We build walls that separate us. And never, never are we to cross them. I love the statement on the right, on my right, I am not arrogant, I'm just better at this than you are. In my community right now, there is an organization who literally is saying publicly, we are the only organization in our town who should be working with youth because nobody else knows what they're doing. Really? They do not have the capacity to impact all 200 youth that are going to experience homelessness unaccompanied on our streets tonight. But because of pride, because of silos, because of differences, because of arrogance, they are literally publicly saying, we are the only organization. Mel Trotter shouldn't do youth, Arbor Circle shouldn't do youth, Family Prom, they should not do youth because we are the only ones who know how to do youth. How do you get anything done? How do you get anything done? What if we thought differently? What if we put those that we're trying to serve first ahead of us? What if we collaborated more? What if we reached out to those who might be different? What if we embraced change? And what if we changed the world? It doesn't take that much. We were talking at our table over lunch, and I can't wait for Dr. Hicks to come up here, because we were talking about the power of relationship. And you know how relationships happen? By seeking someone out and sitting down and talking to them. Stephen Covey, Stephen Covey says in Seven Habits, seek first to understand and then to be understood. But if you're like me and so many other people, I want you to understand me. I don't really want to understand you. Let me tell you what you should do. Let me tell you what we're doing that you should do. Let me tell you why we're better. But what happens when we sit down and say, tell me about what you're doing, tell me about what's working. What happens when we come with that kind of humility? What happens when we say, when we look at our organizations and we say, you know, we're doing a lot of things, but we're not doing a lot of things well. 
And is there somebody out there that is doing this particular thing better than we are? And should we partner with them instead of try and do it ourselves? Because just in my community alone in Western Michigan, we are wasting so many federal and so many donor dollars by duplication of services that produce a terrible return on investment. And that could be completely turned around if we had the humility to come together and say, you do that really well, I do this really well, what kind of an impact could we have together? Wow, thank you. I think what we're talking about is building a framework for success. Using, I love the phrase, co-laborers, and William is talking about it. How do we build this framework of co-laborers for success? How do we engage the schools better? Who knows first about a family experiencing homelessness? The teacher, the teacher. But yet, the schools have come to us and they've said, we have liaisons and we have this. We don't know, we can identify them and we can give them a gas card and we can maybe this, but we don't know what to do to actually help them get out of their situation. Awesome, because we're not really good at identifying people up in a rural area, so let's partner together. So we now have staff that are in public schools. Yeah, this Christian organization has staff in public schools and it is beautiful. It is beautiful. We love each other, it's so awesome. It's like kumbaya all the time. I'm a camp director, I have to throw in kumbaya to every speech that I give at least once, it's in my DNA. What if faith and non-faith, what if we started partnering together? The mental health community, we know how important that is, healthcare, public and private funding. Diversion, diversion. You've probably heard the statistic, right? 40% of families that end up homeless, homeless would never end up homeless for a one-time intervention of less than $500. And we're seeing that. Our community, 12 agencies together, we raised, uh, Adrian will correct me, but I wanna say we raised about $400,000 for diversion for families. All kinds of agencies that have every need to compete, every reason to compete, and we said, no, what do we do to help divert families? And here's what it looks like. It looks like a family who, was living on their last dollar paying rent. And dad didn't have a job, but dad got offered a job. However, to take the job, he needed to have brand new steel-toed work boots. Dad had a decision. If I buy the work boots, I'm gonna miss the rent, and if I miss the rent one more time, I'm out. The family's out and we're living in the car. What do you do? What do you do? So through diversion, he was able to contact us and some other organizations, and guess what? For $110, we could get him brand new work boots. Dad is employed, they never became homeless, and we don't even hear from them anymore because they don't need us. What if we started thinking about that? What if we started getting upstream? And I know a lot of you are doing this already. Drop-in centers, shelters, housing, aftercare, we are all a part of the solution. I don't know about your community, but in my community a couple of years ago, the forces aligned to say, the goal is to eliminate all shelter. I don't mean they said, the goal was to eliminate all shelter by making sure we have no homeless and we don't need shelter. No, 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 no. They literally said, all shelters need to go away because they're the problem. Hmm. Well, we worked with 4,600 individuals last year, unique individuals. Where's the housing? For them we don't have any housing for them so you have no housing for them and you want all the shelters to close anybody else see a problem with this where are they gonna go what are we gonna do right but when we live in those silos when we live out of arrogance that's what happens and the people that we're here to serve suffer so what are we gonna do what are you gonna do to have a greater impact who will you invite in? You know, it's really simple. You know, think about in your community, who is it that you don't talk to that's working in this space? Who is it that you don't agree with that's working in this space? And maybe, just maybe, 
if you invited that person out to coffee, that organization out to coffee, and you sat down and said, help me understand what you're doing, or frankly, learn from Justin, why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? It is possible that you might find common ground that you never knew existed, and neither one of you will have to change some of your core beliefs, but you can focus on the things that might actually make a difference, and you might find ways to partner together. Those that are suffering and experiencing homelessness are waiting. They're waiting for us to do better. They're waiting for us to do better. So snow. Snow came to our transgender shelter. And we gave her a place of safety. We gave her a place of acceptance. We gave her a place of love. We did not have everything in our organization that she needed. So what could we give her? Love, safety, compassion, acceptance. And then we helped her connect with HQ, which is a drop-in center that does amazing work. And she got some extra support there. She made some other connections there. We got her connected with a housing assessment program through Salvation Army to start working through all the things that they could give her that we can't give her. And then we connected her to an organization called Wellhouse. Now, Wellhouse organization in Grand Rapids is about as far away from a Christian organization as you can find. In fact, in history, Wellhouse has stood up at community events and like railed against Mel Trotter because we're faith-based. Like, just railed against us. Like, there's been times that I've been sitting in the audience, and they didn't know I was in the audience, and they're, like, talking about me and talking about the thing, and I'm watching the crowd get worked up, and I'm going, security? Um, but they didn't know me. But you know what? I don't care. So we reached across the aisle to Wellhouse, and Snow has now been successfully housed with Wellhouse for almost a year, and she is doing great. She is doing great. Do I care that Wellhouse isn't faith-based? Not at all. I care that Snow is off the streets, and she's safe, and she's getting the care and support that she needs. Alex, 18-year-old, the hearing-impaired youth, connected him with HQ, connected him with Pine Rest Mental Health Services, worked with his school and his interpreters. And then we went across town to an organization called 311, who does nothing but youth housing. Little, little organization. Started like five years ago, um, you know. And this is what they said. They said, you guys are the behemoth in town, and you want to partner with us? Yeah, because you do some things a whole lot better than we do. And we got this guy, Alex, and we need to get him a house. And Alex now has been housed successfully with 311. He's finishing school, and I'm telling you, great things are going to happen through Alex. He's going to do great things. Natalie, the transgender youth from Indiana, she left our shelter, and nobody's heard from her. We have no idea where she is. And I'm telling you, it can bring tears to my eyes just talking about it. And it wakes me up in the middle of the night because I spent just enough time with Natalie to understand that there is no more vulnerable person or no bigger target on the streets than Natalie. And the truth is right now, I don't even know if she's alive. Does this get you up in the morning? Does this make you want to throw down the things that divide us and figure out how we can focus on the things that matter? Because there's people like Natalie that need housing. Shantae, she's still in our youth shelter. She's doing really well. Getting counseling through Pine Rest. She was at, she's with HQ, the drop-in center. She got a job at another nonprofit across town, Steepletown, never thought she would have a job. And her next step is to leave that shelter. Now for my Housing First friends, here's what I've learned. I love Housing First, but it doesn't work for everybody. Because what, you, what we have to do is we have to we have to come to the individual. All four of these people found, found themselves in homelessness through four very different paths. If people find themselves through homelessness from all these different paths, why do we think only one path will work on the way out?
And are we asking the people what they want? Because let me tell you something, when Snow came, she was asked if she wanted to go into a Housing First program and get housing very quickly. You know what Snow said? No. I need a place to heal. I need a place to heal. Had we put Snow into housing right away when she didn't want that, she would have had loneliness and isolation and I don't know where she would be today. But today she's in housing with everything that she needs because she said, no, I need to heal and we need to honor their choice. If I was preaching, I'd say, can I get an amen? Debbie, there you go. But I'm not preaching. I'm not preaching. So let me end with, uh uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Let me end with my version of maybe a story you've heard before. A mom and her daughter were walking to the ocean to watch the sunset. And as they were getting closer to the ocean, they saw this old man in the distance. And all they could see in the distance was he'd bend down, throw. Bend down, throw. And they didn't know what he was doing. And the little girl said, Mommy, what's he doing? And I don't know, let's go see. So they walked over. And as they were walking close, they saw millions of starfish on the shore. And they realized that what the old man was doing was he was bending down, he was picking up a starfish, and he was throwing it in the ocean to save its life. And the mom, a bit cynical, said to the old man, what are you doing? And he said, I'm saving a starfish life. And she said, are you crazy? There's millions of starfish. You'll never be able to make a difference. And the old man bent down, and he picked up a starfish, and he threw it in the ocean, and he said, I made a difference to that one. And the daughter looks up at the mother and she says, Mom, I want to make a difference too. And she bends down and she picks up a starfish and she didn't throw it because she's more gentle. So she walked over and she placed it in the water. And then she walked back and she picked up a starfish and walked over and placed it gently in the water. And suddenly the mom got it. And the mom bent over and picked up a starfish and threw it in the water. Suddenly, the impact was threefold. Notice, they didn't throw him in the water the same way. The old man was underhand. The girl was placing the starfish in the water. And the mom was throwing overhand. Apparently, the method of saving lives is not as important as actually saving lives. What if the next couple that came to the beach that saw the three bent down and started saving starfish? And what if then the couple after that and the couple after that? Think of the difference that could be made. So my question for you and for me today is what are we willing to do to save the lives of those who desperately need us? I do focus groups from time to time with those that we serve at Maltrotter, and here's what I've noticed. If I'm doing a focus group with anybody that's over 40, all hope is gone. All hope is gone. The blame game sets in, all hope is gone. But when I've sat down and done focus groups with the youth in our shelter, with the youth in our transitional homes, with the youth in our transgender shelter, when I sit with them, they have hope. They still have hope. And I say, what do you want? And they're like, help, love, job, school, family. Can you help me with any of that? They are crying out for us to lay down our differences, to come together and have a greater impact and actually change this world one life at a time. Thank you very much. Wow. 
Um, I got to admit to you, I am terrified. Um, I have not ever had to follow that. Um, I am an academic who actually thinks it makes sense to write gobbledygook like I research agent-based models to test various stakeholder inclusion strategies. I'm so sorry, Justin, to make you read that. You know what that means? It means we spent, uh, my friend Eric Johnson and I, a colleague at ASU, we spent a year traveling across Colorado when we interviewed 400, 400 folks who had started collaborative initiatives. Um, and we asked, how did you get it started? And we found there were really two answers. One said, we just announced it to the world. We, we flooded social media, we put up flyers, we put ads in papers, we told all our friends, please show up six o'clock Monday night, we want to start something real together. And the other group said, I reached out to one person, and they reached out to another person. Then we went together and reached out to someone else, and together they went to someone else, pairwise, bit by bit by bit. And we were wondering, which one of those strategies work better? And in fact, what we had found in the other empirical research, that open call, which is totally understandable why you would do it, works about 24% of the time. And that pretty much matches what we know about collaboration. One out of four collaborations show a difference in community and public health outcomes. You know, it's a very frightening statistic for those of us who have devoted our life to doing this. Um, and we thought, well, maybe this has something to do with it. So geeks like us, we sat down and wrote a computer simulation of, a, of these two different strategies for including people. And we made them do it 50,000 times. And we found out that that relational method, I and Dennis would get together and then we would sit down with Justin. We wouldn't ask Justin if he wanted to join us. Dennis and I would just talk. And Justin would see our commitment. It would become visible to Justin. It was important that we didn't offer him the invitation. We ended lunch, said thanks, man, for coming. And we went. Justin would call us up later on. Or we might call Justin and say, what do you think? And Justin says, I want to be a part of that. We said, OK, be a part of it. And then Justin and I went out to lunch with Debbie. And then Debbie and Dennis went to lunch. And then Dennis and William. And so on and so on. If you do it that way, it takes a little longer. 94% success rate in sustaining the collaboration over a one year period. Right? So, you know, even though it's really kind of, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a geek. I do things like that because I think it's important and I think it's fun. But in the end, I think I'm motivated by the same things that you are. Justin asked me why I do what I do, and I go, I am convinced that the way we speak to each other, the way we relate to each other, can transform the world. I've just taken it upon myself to try to prove that through science. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to do it. I don't have any great stories to share with you today, but I do have some insights that I'd like to say to help provide source. You know everything that Dennis said is true. I just want to reiterate that and try to prove it to you. So I want to say, I want to share, just I have about 10 minutes, I want to share three insights. That is, these are studies, the best empirical research that I know on collaboration kind of collated and said there are three insights that we know that there's a pattern, a common pattern that the most successful collaborative efforts display. The first one is that successful collaboratives start with and focus on the quality of the process for making decisions. This work comes from my mentor, Carl Larson, who wrote a book with David Crisp called Collaborative Leadership in 1994, that was sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation, and they studied the most 52 most successful civic collaboratives as named by the American Civic League um, that they had seen. And they found one common feature among all 52 of those, the presence of an open, incredible process. The second 
book comes from Carl and Frank LaFosto in 2001 called When Teams Work Best, and it's a study of 6,000 collaboratives. It's the largest empirical study ever done on collaboration, and they found the same thing. That is, if you take the time to create an open, incredible process, a process that is truly inclusive, that treats people equally, that listens to their voices, then you can make a huge difference in this world. If you don't take that time, right, if you just jump in with all your great intentions and say, let's try to solve this problem, then unfortunately you're more likely to fail than succeed. The one feature they found common to really successful collaborations, the ones that make profound differences on a large scale, was that the, they had co-constructed the process. So we talked about co-laboring. That co-laboring begins with the ability to sit down in each other's presence and say, how will we work together? Will we take the time to construct the process and then will we use that process to really understand the situation, to define the problem, to go out and talk to people to find out the real felt needs of that community, of that population, and holding off on proposing any solution whatsoever. The biggest mistake you can make in creating a process is jumping straight to solutions and say, how do we get it done, right? Again, it's so tempting. I have to stop myself from doing it all of the time. I love telling people how they should solve their problems, especially my daughter, and, um, and she hates it. Um, but um, I, I, I know better. I know that you have to take the time to develop a high quality process. The second feature of successful collaborations is the distribution of power. Now, when Dennis is asking, what is it that divides us and what is it that unites us, I want to argue there's one word that encompasses everything he said, and that is power. Right? And I mean, it might be the power that we feel between people of different genders or races or faiths. But it actually also means that when we're sitting in the room with each other, all concerned about a, a common problem, what is the power differential between us? And how is that actually spoken and played out? I'm a big believer that nothing is real until it is performed. Right? And we perform power constantly. So power can divide us. That is, we can each sit there and say, I, am, I have control over my set of resources. I have power to decide what I and my home organization will do. And will I cede that power to the collective? Right, Because every collaboration is, starts with that existential choice. How much of my identity am I willing to give up to see to the collective identity that we're building together, right? And what we have found is that power has, to, there's two features of power that matter greatly. The first one is, despite your role and rank, that when you're in that process, you do everything you can to treat each other as equals. What matters here are your ideas and your insights and your experience, not your position, not your salary, not your title, not your purse, but what matters is what you bring to the table. I often ask people that if you wanna know if you're truly equal in a group, ask yourself one question. Am I the person or a person who could stand up and say something that would cause everyone else at the table to stop and rethink what they're doing? If you are that person, you are equal. If you are not that person, you are not equal. Meaning that each one of us, to be equal, has to have the power to have a disproportionate impact on the outcome. We have to give each other that power. The second, and I think even more important insight, is what we call authentic power. And in, there's gonna be a listening session after this, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about what that means. But what, in short, it is the ability to dream, then to design, from design to implementation. That is, you wanna give 
the people in that room the power to do all three. What you do not want to do is divide those tasks. You're the dreamers, you're the designers, and you're the implementers, right? Because those divisions will then start feeling like you're inauthentic. It won't feel like real collaboration. And the rational thing to do in that case is to be begin to withdraw your commitment. Now, in these kinds of groups, withdrawal of commitment is never to leave. It's too much face threat to leave. There's, you're probably mandated to be there, right? So what you do is you tell everybody you're committed and you start bringing a little less at each meeting to the table and you see a slow seeping commitment, right? We have developed an instrument called the Process Quality Scale. Again, I'll share it this afternoon. Um, and we've used it in hundreds of settings, in child welfare, in transportation planning, in you know, evidence-based programs like the Nurse Family Partnership, early childhood coalitions, juvenile justice reform. And there are just three questions on that survey that have predicted the difference between high and low performing sites in every single instance. And they ask about, is that decision been made in advance and simply confirmed by the process? Do I feel like I have to justify myself while others' points of views are simply taken for granted and are strings being pulled from the outside? Those three things, if they exist, signal an inauthentic process, but the absence of them is an authentic process. And what we have found over and over and over again is that authentic processes engender incredible amounts of commitment to shared goals. But more importantly, and this is the cornerstone of all my work, my central question is, does it make a difference how we collaborate into the kind of measurable outcomes that we're targeting, right? So for instance, I spent 15 years studying a program called the Nurse Family Partnership. You may have heard of it. It's a evidence-based home visitation program where nurses visit young mothers, often at risk, sometimes homeless, from the fourth month of pregnancy until the child's two years old. We've, and what we did is we studied in three states, we went to every community and interviewed every person that was involved in bringing that program to their community. And then we rated them from top to bottom in terms of how authentic their collaboration was. And we found a perfect rank order correlation between the quality of their outcomes and the quality of their collaboration. Meaning that the one predictor that could tell you how much, we call it dosage and fidelity in this world, how much of the program they receive, but more importantly, the fidelity to the program. And what, what I'm talking about here in non-technical terms is how, much, how many visits did that nurse make with that mother? How long did she stay? How much of the program did she deliver? And how close that mother felt to the nurse? We found that the best predictor of that relationship between the nurse and the mother was the quality of collaboration in the community that took place five years before. That was more important than her age, her health status, her education status, her social economic status, the community's social economic configuration. All of those combined explain 10% of the variation between the quality of the relationship between the nurse and the mother the quality of that collaboration in that community, again, five years before, this nurse has never even heard of this collaboration, explained 28% of the variance. Now that's pretty huge in social science. It's actually three times more important than any characteristic about that nurse or that mother or the community she lives in, right? And we kept on asking ourselves, why is that? So what we did was we go, we measured the community, now let's go and let's measure the agencies that take control of the program and let's look at how collaborative they are. And then and from there, and we found a tight relationship. The more collaborative the community, the more collaborative the agency. We go, we weren't done. We go, now let's go look at all the nursing teams. So we listened to hours and hours of tapes of nurses, interviewed about 300 nurses, and found that the quality of the collaboration in the nursing team is explained most of the variation in what's called compassion fatigue. That is, whether they burnt, burnt out or they stayed engaged. So we knew 
that the quality of the collaboration told you everything that you needed, most everything you needed to know about her relationship with that mother. And then we looked at the relationship between the mother and the nurse. And we found, again, this profound thing we call the transfer of commitment. That commitment, five years, and we waited five years, we collected our data on community collaboration and we didn't do anything else for five years, right? And, that, and over that period of time, that commitment generated in that collaborative effort transferred to the agency, transferred to the nursing team, and transferred to the nurse and then to the mother. And it made all the difference in the world in those sites. So authentic power is the key to successful outcomes, finally. Um, and this is the cutting edge in collaboration research that successful collaborative teams, we know that they have, they have co-labored and created a process together for making decisions, for allocating resources, for assigning responsibilities. We know that that process has to be open and credible. We know that open and credible processes are more likely to engender authentic, a sense of authentic power. Now for those two things to remain constant, you have to have vigilance. You have to constantly monitor and assess that collaboration as it's going on. That means your collaborative group needs to assign a process monitor. And that can be rotating or it can be external, but someone to monitor the process. And in order to monitor that process, what they need is a platform for making the thoughts and thinking, the interaction and the reasoning of that collaborative visible and accountable. And what, what that means in human terms is that you're sitting in a collaborative and you want to see how does your insight, how does your idea travel through this system? Are you speaking into a void? Did you say something nice and everybody nodded and applauded and say, man, that was awesome, and then you never heard about it again? Right? How many of you felt that before, haven't you? Um, what you need is a, a platform that says, no, it's been recorded. It ha I see it flow through the system. I see how other people interact with it. And if you do that, then uh, what will be revealed is a prof simple but profound truth that you all already know, but it's really easy to forget, especially for people like me and people who fund these programs. And that is, if you think about the moments when you were working with the people you serve, you're a care caregivers, and you care for people. So in this case, it's homeless and runaway youth. When you think about those moments of intense breakthrough that you had with them, and you start saying, why, how did that happen? It will probably have everything to do with how you spoke to them, how you listened to them, how you thought with them, how you interacted with them, right? Now what's key is that that same technology, that same pattern of interaction has to be isomorphic, it's what it's called. All I mean is it needs to be in each part of that ecosystem of care that you have created. The way that you help that person change their life is takes the same communicative skills and competence than it did five years before when you sat down with those people from all those silos and said, how can we address this problem together? And if you can make that visible and you can make everyone see that, they will commit everything they have to that goal. They will change how they think and they will change their identity in order to do that. And when they do that, anything is possible. Thank you. Here's some references if you want them. I know they're going to download this on a. Um, oh, no, nope, wrong way. No, it went away. Okay, well, there's all the research that supports that is on a slide that'll be loaded on the conference site.
right. How about one more big round of applause for all our lunch speakers? Mural winners, right? Justin, all right. Dennis, Darren, thank you so much. Okay, well, I just have a few housekeeping announcements and then I will let you move on to the next thing. So first, I'm sure we haven't mentioned it yet, but for those grantees in the room, who wants to know about their stipend? Really, nobody? Keep it all. All right. Well, the stipend request information is both um, in your program and the um, due date for the stipend request is September, or excuse me, September, huh? December 3rd. So make sure that you attend the conference or the training in full and that you complete that information and get it back to the RITAC office by December 3rd so we can get those stipends back out to you. One stipend per agency. Okay, and if you have any questions, you can certainly ask any of the RITAC staff. Also, Debbie mentioned it already, but we do want you to do your evaluations. Those are available both on the app or in paper, let us know. Um, but everything that we do, more of the same or more different, we get from you. And so we really need to have that information on those evaluations, if you would. I know that site visits are next. So if you signed up in advance to go on the site visit, there was a ticket in your name badge. Um, you paid in advance, so we need you to meet downstairs in the lobby, across from the registration desk, next to the Starbucks, um, no later than 2.45, with your ticket in hand. Now, uh, you must be present at that time, or you might lose your seat, okay? So if you didn't sign up for the site visit and you would like to attend, you are also welcome to go down and line up. We ask that you bring five dollars, it's exact change. The funds that we collect for the site visit go to the agency that we're visiting because they do allow us to come in to their home and take a look and learn from them. So we give them that money, so, so please make sure if you want to go that, um, and you line up to do that, that you bring five dollars with you. What we will do is beginning at 2.55, we will begin to fill the empty seats. So if folks who had tickets don't show up, then we'll from that line begin to fill those seats and then once the buses are full the buses are full if you're not going on site visits there are 11 workshops that we invite you to make sure that you attend because there's great information in all of those I think we heard from um, Darren's is going to be one of those so make sure that you um, take part in those and then finally don't miss tomorrow morning uh, it is a plated breakfast we have some great information that's going to be shared at that time and you just never know what we might be sharing is that right Okay, thank you. Have a great afternoon.